Here's Trump. So interesting to see progressive Democratic Congresswomen who originally came from countries whose governments are complete and total catastrophe, the worst, most corrupt and inept anywhere in the world, if they even have a functioning government at all, now loudly and viciously telling the people of the United States, the greatest and most powerful nation on earth, how our government is to be run. So let's just stop there. So he's saying these progressive Democratic Congresswomen came from horrible countries with horrible governments that are total catastrophes. They're corrupt and they're inept and they're horrible. And now, how dare them, they're telling the greatest and most powerful nation on earth how the government is to be run. Now just take that on its face. I mean, put aside what these women actually advocate. Put aside what they actually believe. But is this a legitimate thing to say about anybody? You came from a horrible place. The countries that you came from are dysfunctional. They're the worst and the most corrupt. They're inept. And as a consequence, you should have no voice. You should not be in a position to tell the people of the United States of America how to run their government. Now, what is this? What is the first thing that comes to mind? What, what is he doing here? Well, this is collectivism in, in its most obvious, ugly, and disgusting form. He's basically saying that if you come from a country that is a catastrophe, that is corrupt, that is inept, that is horrible, then who are you to talk about the U.S.? Now, somebody's saying it's a waste of time to examine the tweets as opposed to strategic aim. There is no strategic aim of value when the tweets are as disgusting as these tweets are. There is no strategic aim that is worthwhile when the tweets are as disgusting as they are. Now, I will get to the strategic aim, and it's not what you think it is. And the strategy, by the way, failed, even the strategy that he thinks. But it doesn't matter what the strategic aim is. There is no strategic aim beyond the content of the tweets. Words matter. Speech matters. Text matters. What you say matters. What your aim is... Who cares? And of course, we will draw the strategic goal from this. And I know what Trump's strategic aim is here. It's obvious what his aim is here, and we'll get to that. And he succeeded in his aim, and we'll, we'll get to exactly what his strategic aim is. But the question is, what is he saying? And we must evaluate him. Donald J. Trump, the President of the United States, not on our imagined strategic goal, although I'm fine with evaluating him on that as well, but on what he actually says. And if this is a game, then the fact that the United States President is playing a game with words that are disgusting is disgusting. So either way you look at this, this is horrific. Anyway, this is the worst form of collectivism possible. It's basically attributing the character, the ideas, the, the philosophy of the people from where you come to you. You come from Somalia, so you must be the equivalent of Somalians, just like all Somalians. You're all a bunch of Islamist nuts. Now, even if this woman, this congresswoman who is a Somali is really bad, it doesn't justify saying this. Ayn Rand, when she came to the United States, you could have written exactly the same thing. Who the hell are you to tell us how to run this great American country? This is a country, the greatest nation on earth, the most powerful nation on earth, and you come from a communist country. Who the hell are you to tell us how to run our country? Now, again, this is just some Joe Schmo saying this. This is the President of the United States attributing the characteristic of a people to an individual. Now that is racism and that is collectivism.
No matter what he says beyond that, that they is enough, is enough to categorize these tweets as racist, to categorize these tweets as collectivist. Now let's go on. Why don't they go back and help fix the totally broken and crime-infested places from which they came? Why should they? Why shouldn't they stay here and help fix, according to Donald Trump, if you listen to his campaign speeches, the totally broken and crime-infested United States of America? Isn't the United States of America, isn't it carnage in the streets of America? Isn't that what Donald Trump told us in his inaugural address two years ago, two and a half years ago? Why should they go back? Why shouldn't they stay here? By the way, three of the four of this so-called squad that he is criticizing were born in the United States. They're as American as Donald Trump is American. Now, we'll get to their views later. Their views should be criticized. But not based on where they come from. Not based on their color of... On their, on their country of origin or the color of their skin. Now, he's not making the color of the skin argument. He's just making, he's just making the where they come from argument. Then they came back and, sh and then they come back after they've been to their place and fixed it and show us how it's done. These places need your help badly. You can't leave fast enough. I'm sure that Nancy Pelosi would be very happy to quickly work out free travel arrangements. Now, notice the argument. Go back to where you came from. Go back. Now, this is an argument. This go back to where you came from. This is a meme. This is a, uh, a, a statement that is all over the alt-right. It's all over the place. When I did a show on the alt-right and they came out and criticized me, the tweets I got most of, go back to Israel. When Donald Trump gets elected, we can organize an airplane and put you on an airplane and send you back to Israel. Who are you as an Israeli to come and tell us, Americans, how to run our country? Pure and utter collectivism and the, and the most ugly form of it. You know, again, kind of nation-based kind of racism. That's what Donald Trump is preaching in these tweets. And when he's criticized about it, the next day he says, you know, the, you know, he's told that maybe this is offending people. Um, aren't you concerned? Them? He's asked, aren't you concerned that many people saw that tweet as racist? And he says, it doesn't concern me because many people agree with me. And this is the strategy, guys. This is the strategy. You want strategic insight? Well, the strategic insight is obvious. The strategic insight is to throw red meat in front of his base. And too much of his base, much of his base, is xenophobic, racist, and collectivist. And this is what is shocking about Donald Trump's election. And what is shocking about the way he is defended everywhere is that there is a significant percentage of the American people that I never thought this was a reality. But there is a significant number of American people who are indeed racist, who are indeed collectivists, who do want to judge people not based on their character, but based on where they come from. So this is red meat. This is red meat to his base. And it was viewed that way. And if you look at Twitter, if you follow Twitter, then, yeah, I mean, the, the base loved this. The alt-right loved it. Yeah, the alt-right is still around. Still publishes its, uh, its journals. It's still there strongly on Twitter. It's still here on my chat on YouTube. The alt-right is strong, and I, I think ultimately growing, because it's growing from the alt-right into the conservative movement. So I talked about this when I talked about the conservative civil war. More and more and more conservatives are adopting the ideas of the alt-right. They're adopting the ideas of we white Americans. Not me, because I'm not, I don't count as a white American. Um, we white Americans are being replaced by people who don't look like us. 
That's, that's what's happening to the conservative movement. And Donald Trump knows that. And he's encouraging it. He's encouraging it. There is a real civil war among conservatives. And he has a stake in that civil war. He wants the collectivists, the statists, the authoritarians among the conservatives. And I read you quotes from those authoritarians in a show a few weeks ago, and you can go back and listen to it. I think I called it the conservative civil war, conservative fighting among each other. I can't remember. And he is providing them with as much support as he can. It's exactly what he did in Charlottesville. What he did in Charlottesville is support his base. Make sure not to antagonize your base. Make sure not. Oh, yeah, you say something negative about those neo-Nazis. But all those people affiliated with the neo-Nazis, all those people marching with the neo-Nazis, all those people surrounding the neo-Nazis, you know, and walking with them and marching with them and not objecting to them, they're all good guys. They're all with you. Look, if you think in terms of being replaced, being white, other people not being white, you are a racist or you're falling into a racist way of thinking about the world. A racist way of thinking about the world. The color of people's skin matters not. What's being replaced? Your color of the skin? Your kids are now going to be brown instead of white? Or Americans are going to be brown instead of white? Why does that matter? Who cares? That's exactly the racism. That's exactly the disgusting nature of what is going on here. Well, the new intellectual, then, you would, you would imagine would be a fairly recent phenomenon. Uh, have there been any of this type in the past that you can remember that you would like to point out? Uh, what type I would hold as the new intellectual? Right. Well, only to name a few historical examples in the most general way. Mm -hmm. Aristotle is the man I would talk as, take as the first intellectual in history, in the best sense of the word. The founding fathers were Americans, America's first intellectuals because they were thinkers who were also men of actions. They were the men who knew that a reason is man's guide to reality, that man can achieve an ideal way of life on earth by means of his reason, and that man requires freedom in order to be guided by his judgment and his mind, that man should deal with one another by trade, by persuasion, but not by force and compulsion. It's the Founding Fathers who established uh, in the United States of America the first and only free society in history, and the economic system, which was the corollary of the American political system, was capitalism, the system of total, unregulated, laissez-faire capitalism. This was the basic principle of the American uh, way of life or the American political system. However, in practice, it has never yet been practiced. A total separation of government and economics had not been established from the first. It was implied in principle, but certain loopholes or contradictions were still allowed into the American setup and into the American Constitution, which permitted collectivist influences to undermine the American way of life, and today it is practically collapsing. Today, there is nothing left except an undefined tradition. The active intellectual direction of our society at present is anti-American and anti-intellectual. It is going back to the primordial mysticism of dictatorships and rule by force. Therefore, the new intellectuals now should be those men who will stand up for two fundamental values, the value of their own life, of their inalienable rights, of their self-esteem, their independence, and the value of a non-coercive free society in which men do not use force against one another.